Hi, and welcome to Failureology, a podcast about engineering failures. I'm your host, Nicole. And I'm Brian, and we're both from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Before we start, I just want to say a special thanks to our first Patreon subscriber. You know who you are, and surprisingly, it's not my mom. Mine either. My dad would probably sign up if he knew what a Patreon was. Unfortunately, though, Patreon isn't available on 8-track or fax machine yet, so I guess your dad will have to wait a little bit longer. But yes, as Brian said, big, big thank you to our first Patreon subscriber. We appreciate you appreciating us, supporting our show. Please, listeners, go check out our Patreon page. There's a link in the show notes. In addition to supporting our show, though, we also have three mini failures on our page so far. Lake Pagnor, which drained into a salt mine in a matter of minutes, the Walkie Talkie building in London, which melted a car and fried an egg, and our latest episode about the Manchester CIS insurance building, the south half of this building was originally covered in small mosaic tiles that began falling off the building immediately after construction, which is not supposed to happen. Definitely not. So with subscribing to our Patreon, you're basically getting all of the failures that we've been wanting to talk about, but haven't been able to dig up enough information for a regular episode. Also, since these are bonus episodes, you do get a little bit of extra tangents. If you listen to the show, you know we love tangents. And the mini failures are posted on opposite Sundays from our regular episodes, so you get to hear our lovely voices once a week. Check out the link in the show notes. Please support our show. This week in engineering news, the $10 billion James Webb Space Telescope has been removed from its transport container in French Guiana in preparation for its launch in early December. The James Webb Space Telescope will allow astronomers to look deeper into the cosmos, which means further back in time, than is currently possible with the Hubble Space Telescope. This will be possible due to the larger mirror size on the James Webb Space Telescope, so 6.5 meter diameter mirror on the James Webb Space Telescope versus the current 2.4 meter mirror on the Hubble Space Telescope, and a whole slew of instruments that are tuned into the infrared spectrum. The James Webb Space Telescope started its journey in California from the, the Northrop Grumman factory all the way to French Guiana, and it transited through the Panama Canal, which we talked about on episode 30 of Failureology. Yeah, that was a really interesting episode. The canal is fascinating. Who thought? It's kind of, it's just a waterway, but it's so interesting. But what's really cool is that they built the Panama Canal with steam shovels, essentially, and in the last couple of weeks, a telescope that's going to let us look back many many light years went through the panama canal yeah that is kind of cool so are they taking the hubble space telescope out of commission or is this a replacement or is this an addition do you know it's an addition with i think the the intent of being to slowly take the hubble space telescope out of service it's a it's slightly different packages um it's kind of like upgrading your tv you still keep your old tv around when you get a larger tv it just gets relegated to different things like a bedroom tv or the kids playroom tv um <laughs> it's still functional but it's just not as good as the new technology right so so the james webb space telescope is the living room television is what you're telling us pretty much that's that, that's a good comparison <laughs> i think um who operates it is it operated by france or the united states believe it's operated by nasa primarily and then i assume that they would sell portions of, of the telescope or you know kind of operating time to different space agencies around the world because this does allow astronomers to look back so far it's just it, it's a really cool thing and, and space programs usually have a lot of international cooperation in them different people have different research interests and it's important to share these things because there's not one country that can really feasibly develop something like this and put it into space by itself so it launches in early December, I believe, December the 8th, I believe, is its launch date. And then it'll take about 30 days for everything on the space telescope to to deploy. So the, the heat shields and the solar shields and all of the, the mirrors have to deploy. So getting it into space or even getting it to the launch pad that was kind of just the first stage in this in this whole adventure, there's a lot of things that need to go right at the correct time. So after they launch it, the first, I feel the first month, the first 30 days, there's going to be a lot of people that have worked on this project that are fairly, uh, fairly tense about it, um, hoping that everything goes, goes correctly. Because one thing not going correctly can delay or um, possibly make it so that the, the James Webb Space Telescope can't be put into service. 
yeah, I'm not surprised. I would also be pretty stressed out right about now. Yeah. I mean, if I spent $10 billion on something, I would <laughs> want it to work. And unfortunately, it's not like you just pull over to the side of the road and fix something. Like, it's it's going to be in space. And for transportation into space, everything has to be folded up and compacted. So once it gets into space, everything has to slowly unfold itself. So there's a lot of actuators that need to fire at the correct time and cable systems and pulley systems that need to work absolutely correctly. And all it takes is something firing slightly out of sequence and then the next 5,000 steps of the deployment can't um, can't work. Yeah, well, and there's probably people that have been working on this project for years and, you know, they're they're finally seeing all of their hard work come to life. But, you know, designing something on paper isn't quite the same as putting, it's like, it's like taking, you know, your theoretical design and making it practical. It doesn't always transfer 100%. No, it, it it certainly doesn't. But they've done extensive testing on the ground and in models and simulation review. But there's always something that can go wrong. And having it happen in, in space is about the, the worst place for something to go wrong. True. Well, I'm certainly rooting for them. So I hope that everything goes well. And this is likely not the last time you'll be hearing us talk about this. I think this telescope likely warrants itself a Engineering Marvel episode in the future. So. Stay tuned for that. Yes, and certainly probably an update on the engineering news segment. No matter what happens, whether the deployment's successful or whether it's not successful, I feel that there will be something to talk about either way. Agreed. If you want to read more about the James Webb Space Telescope, check out our website, failureology.ca, for links to all the sources for this episode. The new season of the 32-team professional hockey league that plays in Canada and the United States has started which means the Toronto professional hockey team might win the end-of-season mug. When hell finally freezes over and the Toronto professional hockey team wins the big game, there's definitely going to be a parade. Toronto Professional Hockey Team Parade Planning Services is your one-stop sports mug championship parade planning service. Don't be like Vancouver. They rioted because their professional hockey team has never won a championship. Call Toronto Professional Hockey Team Parade Planning Services toll-free at 1-866-865-1967. Now on to this week's engineering failure, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. We couldn't decide if the tower was an engineering failure or an engineering marvel, so we stuck this episode halfway in between the marvels, which we cover every 10th episode. This being episode 35, this is why we're talking about it. Whatever it is, though, we feel it's a really, really cool building. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting. So going into it, I, I really wasn't sure if it was a marvel or a failure. And having researched it, I'm still, you know, I'm still not really sure. So I think the jury's definitely still out on that. But yeah, like you said, it's a really, really cool building. Um, so the Leaning Tower of Pisa is a freestanding bell tower in the Italian city of Pisa. It's almost 56 meters tall. The outer base has a diameter of 15.5 meters, and the walls at the base of the tower are 2.44 meters thick. I myself am about 1.57 meters tall, so the walls are thicker than I am tall, which is a little bit mind-boggling to me uh, to just kind of visualize how how thick these walls are. Those those are fairly thick walls. I believe that's right around eight feet for wall thickness. So there's there's some houses and apartments that I've been in where the ceilings aren't even eight feet and that's how thick the wall is in this tower yeah and it's i mean it's a circle so so you lose about five meters off of the you know there's a five meter difference from the outside diameter to the inside diameter the tower has 296 steps to the top this thing is really really old there's no elevator we're walking to the top so the calgary tower where, where we live here in calgary it has 802 steps to go to the top and I've actually run up those stairs a number of times for, for some different charity events over the years. 802 steps. It doesn't seem like that many steps on the ground. And then doing okay by floor 10. And after that, it's it's just a lot of stairs. So I would prefer 296 steps over the 802 <laughs> steps. Yeah. Well, and the funny thing, if you're from Calgary, 
you'll get this joke, but everyone jokes that the Calgary Tower, because uh, it's so short. So there's people in office towers that look out their office window down at the Calgary Tower because it was built in the 60s and a lot of towers around it are taller than it. So, which is interesting. Not like the CN Tower, which we're also going to cover hopefully soon uh, as a marvel. That's obviously much taller than the buildings around it. So the Leaning Tower of Pisa was used by Nazi forces as an observation post during World War II. And one of the U.S. Army sergeants decided not to call in an artillery strike against the tower's position. Which I feel is really good because it likely wouldn't be here today if they did call in an artillery strike. And we may or may not have talked about it then. It's so interesting to think about. I have never lived in a place that has survived war times. It's, it takes a second for me to process the fact that this tower survived probably two world wars amongst other wars and is still standing. That isn't something I've experienced before. That's kind of mind boggling to process. Yeah. And, and even the fact that it's been around for that period of time to survive, you know, obviously multiple world wars as well as other conflicts that happened in, in Italy and, and in Rome. And we live in a country that has been around for essentially less than 200 years. Yeah. So we recently had our municipal election to elect the new mayor and council of Calgary. And so I was looking up data because congratulations, we have our first female mayor ever. And we have only had a mayor for 137 years. That's uh, that's how old we are as a city. It's not very old. We're very new in, t- in terms of the global scale. I feel like there's moss on some buildings in Europe that's probably older than that. Probably. The tower was also declared a World Heritage Site along with the neighboring cathedral, baptistery, and cemetery in 1987. There are 3 million visitors every year just for the tower, and then there's additional 6 million visitors that come to see the Miracle Square, which is essentially the park area that houses the tower, the cathedral, cemetery, baptistery, and then there's a few other buildings in the mix. Yeah, and, and we'll put pictures up in the, on the website in case you're not familiar with the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Yeah, I didn't realize there were other structures that were that were built right around it. I didn't realize it was a park with a group of of structures in it. I kind of thought the tower was by itself. I mean, you, when you see pictures, everyone just sends you a picture, like everyone just shows you the picture of the tower. So I had, yeah, I had not realized there was a, there was a whole park along with it. So that was pretty cool. Actually, what I think is really funny about pictures from Leaning Tower of Pisa is pictures where there's other people in the background that look like they're just randomly pushing against things in the air because the viewpoints don't quite line up for... <laughs> the perspective that the picture was taken from that that always makes me laugh yeah if you if you don't know what we're uh talking about or you haven't seen this before a lot of people send or a lot of people take pictures of themselves such that it looks like they're pushing the tower back up or protect protecting it from falling over just the way the camera is focused and the, the angle of the shot but if you take a picture and you see someone else doing that in the background then they're just kind of holding their hands up for nothing so that would be actually really funny Nicole, have you ever gone to uh, gone to Italy or Rome to see the Leaning Tower of Pisa? No, have you? I have not either. Yeah, no, I um, I have not. I I've traveled a lot of North America, but I have not traveled a lot of Europe, so I have not been. I well, now I want to go now that I've researched it. But go before I probably would have thought it would be really like I'm. I don't love going where there's large groups of people. <laughs> So I'm not really one for tourist spaces. It's too many people. You can't see anything because there's just people everywhere. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. If I do go, I like to go first thing in the morning when it's not as busy. So I've done the Columbia Ice Fields at just on the south end of Jasper Park. I went. We were the first bus. I think we had a bus left at like 6 or 7 a.m. And... We were the only bus on the, the glacier, which was kind of cool. And as we were leaving, more buses were starting to come in, but we got the whole space to ourselves, which was really cool. So definitely like to, to hit those up early in the morning. Yeah, no, that sounds really cool, except it means I'd have to wake up early. So good on you for doing that. <laughs> yeah, I I have discovered that I'm a morning person. I'm kind of, I was resistant to that for a long time, but I finally succumbed to it. I'm just more productive. I accepted a long time ago that I'm not. <laughs> 
Anyways, construction on the Leaning Tower of Pisa occurred in three stages over 199 years. Construction started in 1173 with a few stones at the base of the tower. 199 years is a really, really long time to work on a project. It's extremely long. I would say most towers from design concept to occupancy take on average four, five, six years. And by the time I get to those projects, I'm like, okay, this has been fun, but let's, let's, you know, let's this be over now. So I would like to do other things. So to work on a project, I mean, this, I mean, I don't know, people don't live 199 years. This project has spanned multiple generations, which is just crazy to think about. Yeah. And they didn't have any email or fax machines or really a fast way to send documents back and forth. So I feel this would just be a really long project that would get dragged on and on. Or even, you know, this was pre-industrial revolution, so they also didn't have a lot of the tools that we have nowadays to make this easier to construct. So this was likely a really challenging project for them to build. And it's still standing, which which says a lot. Yeah. So so this part I find really interesting. So the tower began to sink after construction progressed to the second floor in 1178. And there, at that time, the Republic of Pisa was battling Genoa, Lucca, and Florence. So construction on the tower ceased for almost a century. So they actually built to the second floor, and then they stopped, and they left the tower. They didn't. They basically paused construction. And some experts now believe that without this pause, which allowed the soil to settle, the tower would have almost certainly toppled over, which is really interesting. And we're going to get into the details later, but... A big reason that the tower is leaning is because the soil that it's standing on, the foundation that it's built on, is not stable enough to support it. But what they think is that had they just gone gung-ho and built the whole tower, that unstable soil would have caused the tower to to fall over. But because they paused it for almost 100 years, it allowed the initial weight of those first two floors to kind of compress the soil underneath the tower and actually stabilize it somewhat to allow them to continue building and to allow the tower to stand for as long as it has. That is really, really cool. I know, it's so interesting. And then once they started going again, they obviously recognized that they had a tilt. And so they actually built on the south side, the upper floors are taller than the than the north side of those floors. So they kind of tried to correct the lean as they built the tower. So the tower itself is actually curved and I've seen some drawings or renderings and I think they're probably a little bit exaggerated, but it almost has kind of a, a slight like banana shape to it, which I, which I think is really, really interesting and kind of a pretty creative solution that they, you know, they tried to course correct halfway through the build by making the tower curved. I mean, that's so, it's so interesting. And then the seventh floor of the tower was completed in 1319 and the bell chamber was completed in 1372. So the bell chamber was the last piece. That's the 199 years later. The tower has seven bells, one for each note of the musical major scale. And the largest one was installed in 1655. All right. So like Nicole mentioned, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and like the name alludes to it, it does have some lean on it. So the tower only has a three meter deep foundation, which is not really deep at all, certainly not very deep by by modern standards. And on top of this, the foundation is set in weak and unstable soil, like we mentioned. So on the south side of the tower, the soil was siltier and had more clay in it than the north side. And the sand layer there as well is thinner. So the, the ability of different soils to support differing amounts of weight applied by the tower, it's different between the, the north and the south side just due to the, the soil composition underneath. There is also a really high water table in the area that is said to deposit sediment and shells and vertebrae from small marine animals over time. Since the water table on the north side is higher, there's more sediment that's been deposited on the north side and higher soil on the north side, further contributing to the lean of the tower. As well, the higher water table on the north side leads to more impact from heavy rains during the winter months. So a lot of compounding issues that have contributed to to the lean of this tower. Yeah, so you've got, I would say, more compressible soil on the south side, so sturdier soil on the north side. So that leads to the the north side kind of not shifting as much in the south side, compressing more, which causes it to lean. And then you've got the impact of the water, 
which is one causing it to float, but then also bringing all this extra sediment in and there's depositing more sediment on the north side than the south side. So there's like all these factors that are happening and compounding on each other over time, over centuries to create this lean. It's just, so, it's so interesting. Yeah, so, so there's basically a big wedge that's building up where the, the thicker part of the wedge is on the north side of the tower and the thinner part of the wedge, kind of like a doorstop, would be on the on the south side of the tower. In 1838, a walkway was excavated showing the column plinths and foundation steps. This impacted the water tables as well as the soil strength on the south side where the walkway was located. The tower nearly collapsed when this occurred. So how has this tower stood for almost 850 years, 848 to be exact, and not fallen down yet, despite many almost collapses? And get this, at least four strong earthquakes have hit the region since 1280, which is crazy this there are new brand new buildings that exist today that don't withstand earthquakes and this has withstood four i don't understand it's not like they had earthquake built into their building code that they weren't designing for a seismic spec at least i don't think they were yeah so 850 years four major earthquakes that we know of like nicole talked about and it's still here it's still leaning but it hasn't fallen down yeah they believe the tower survived due to an effect called dynamic soil structure interaction, or DSSI. The height and stiffness of the tower and the softness of the foundation soil influence the vibrational characteristics of the structure in such a way that the tower doesn't resonate with ground motion. This is certainly not my area of expertise, so we'll default to Professor George Milonikis from the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Bristol. He took part in a study that looked into why the tower hadn't collapsed, and he said, quote, Ironically, the same very soil that caused the leaning instability and brought the tower to the verge of collapse can be credited for helping it survive these seismic events. It's like task failed successfully. <laughs> in other words, the tower's height and stiffness combined with the softness of the soil means the structure is protected during an earthquake. It simply doesn't vibrate during the tremors, so... To me, this means that the soil is so soft or soft enough that it kind of almost dulls the vibrations or doesn't transfer the vibrations. It almost acts as a... Just a big dampener. The, the soil's acting as a big dampening medium for the tower. Exactly. And so that's how the tower was able to survive because it doesn't actually vibrate. The it Yeah, the soil dampens that vibration before it even makes it to the tower, which is also super interesting. And, and I'm guessing they just lucked out on Having some of these soil characteristics, they probably just plunk down a tower wherever it seemed convenient without doing a lot of soil studies, I would think. Well, I think too, this, you know, this is the 1100s, which is a long time ago. And they likely didn't really know, you know, I would say somewhat that, you know, civil engineering was in its infancy, geotechnical engineering, understanding the impacts of soil and water. Uh, water tables were also somewhat in their infancy. I, I mean, at least as far as a structure like this, like at the time, this was probably considered somewhat of a superstructure. I mean, it's only eight floors tall, but it's the 1100s. So, you know, I think this construction was probably somewhat advanced. I think they learned a lot. Uh, but I also, yeah, I also think they lucked out on a lot of things. So the soil strength was a hindrance, you know, it, it caused it to lean, but it also saved it from earthquakes. So, I mean, to me, that's a really, really fortunate coincidence. You don't, they didn't plan for that. Yeah. And, and let's not forget too, the, uh, the long pause they took um, between constructing up to the second floor and then continuing on in the construction too. I, with having that weight compacting the soil, I think that also plays a role in at least stabilizing the lean of this tower. Yeah. And we also don't know what they knew about the soil composition. So obviously they weren't digging boreholes. So right now that's common practice, at least in Canada, they'll dig several boreholes around the site. They'll dig them to a specific depth. I assume the depth is based on the size type and depth of the structure that they're planning to put there. And then from there, they'll be able to, you know, when they pull the, the contents out, they can say, okay, we've got this material at this depth, and then we've got this material at that depth, and then the next material, and the next material, and the next material. And so they can kind of give a breakdown of what what type of foundation they're actually digging on. I don't think that type of technology existed here, nor did they perhaps understand 
exactly what each soil meant. And so I think they dug as deep as they thought they needed to dig based on other projects. So, I mean, you know, the, the foundation was three meters deep. Perhaps that was really deep for the time. Perhaps that was all they could dig. I, I honestly, no, I'm not really sure. Perhaps they dug another one in a different Italian city and it worked fine. So they thought they could do it here. You know, it's again, it's the 1100s. There's so many, probably so many unknowns at that point about engineering and so many things that they're learning. And yeah, I think they kind of just somewhat to an ex- to a somewhat extent just lucked out. Yeah. And, and for a lot of projects too, especially ones where there's, there's fill dirt involved after it's compacted, the moisture content in the soil is measured and the, the density of the compacted soil is, is measured now. So we have a much better understanding of, of some of the soil mechanics that go into things and certainly the, the role that compaction of, of soil plays in, in strengthening soil and other structures. Yeah, th- this is hundreds of years before a building code existed and before engineers were a regulated profession. I mean, we've only really been regulated in North America since the early 1900s we've been accredited since before then such that people were trained as engineers before then but you know what we call you know engineers canada the professional engineering associations in the states pnges in canada those are those a lot of those came out of the quebec bridge collapse which we talked about in episode six and i mean that happened in the early 1900s so you know this is well before any of that happened. So uh, yeah, this is such a this is such a cool building. I mean, now I want to go there. Maybe I should just read more on the places that I don't think I want to go because then I always want to go. <laughs> <laughs> Every time, so I just get down these rabbit holes. I'm just like, oh, this is so interesting. Oh, maybe we can go somewhere and do a live failureology episode. That would be cool. Maybe a Marvel one. Yeah, that would be cool. I feel Marvel's probably a little bit easier to do than a, than an actual failure failure episode, since a lot of the time the failure doesn't exist after it fails. So if you want us to go on location and record an episode about an engineering Marvel, support our show so that we can do that. I can even make some terrible puns in person for you. <laughs> All right. So the Leaning Tower of Pisa, it does hold a couple of really cool records. By 1990, the tilt on the tower, so its deflection from vertical, was five and a half degrees. But luckily, though, the Leaning Tower of Pisa had stabilized between 1990 and 2001. And in 2008, scientists announced the movement had finally stopped in the tower, now leaning at a modest 3.9 degrees, is expected to stay put for at least 200 more years, which is great. Fantastic. Yeah, so the, the tower uh, it used to hold the Guinness World Record for the unintentionally furthest leaning tower. Unfortunately, after it was stabilized, it lost this illustrious title. And now that title is ho- held by the Church of Serhusen in Germany, and that has a maximum lean of 5.1939 degrees. Okay, so having a Guinness World Record is obviously super cool claim to fame. But if the tower kept leaning and it fell over it would lose the record anyways so you know i feel like second place is the first winner exactly exactly all right (laughs) all right so just briefly about the church of sir husen according to a local historian the church of sir husen tower was built on marshy land on foundations of oak tree trunks preserved by groundwater when the groundwater was drained the wood rotted and the tower tilted so that, that was kind of an accidental leaning that happened there okay but but a foundation of oak tree trunks brand new sentence when have you heard that before that is so interesting and it was built on marshland like i mean we build on marshland now but not on oak tree trunks so interesting maybe this is a an example of just using local materials that are there um if they had to import rock from a really long way away Maybe they just used what they what they had, and and oak tree trunk foundations seem to seem to work. Just an aside, was using oak tree trunks like a fairly common uh, building method or material back there? Like I know I've been on a couple projects or, or seen some like historical related projects where for houses they had a had a wooden foundation, but I, I believe those were they were somehow treated. I guess pieces of tree trunks from things, but I I think those were only a couple hundred years old. Probably. This was probably super common at some point. I have never heard of this. I think, I mean, you could use treated wood, but over time, 
the you'd wear down whatever that coating was and then the um the wood would start to rot sorry for those listening if you can hear clicking in the background my dog is walking around she'd really like to go outside for a walk so but we will i will take her soon it's almost dinner time so she's she knows she gets walked and then she gets dinner so she's real urgent about that that walk part what a smart dog and the food yeah. part yeah she's very food forward we're food focused at this house food and walks yes Back to the records, the Capitol Gate building in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, is the world's most tilted man-made tower with an 18 degree slope, but that doesn't count since that was part of the design. I think this one has a world record for farthest leaning tower, but it's intentional as opposed to unintentional. Yeah, that's correct. So, so it's a different record they were going after. Yeah, yeah. Intentionally leaning tower. I feel like it doesn't really count because you did it on purpose. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that one. Yeah. The last tower that has a record is the Leaning Tower of Wanaka, um, another well-known leaning building. And this is part of Puzzling World attraction near Wanaka, New Zealand. And it's balanced on one corner and leans at an angle of 53 degrees to the ground. Very cool. Yes. Actually, there's a, there's a there's a sculpture not too far from where I live where it's a it's a church sculpture and it's been completely inverted. And the entire church is basically supported by the by the steeple of the church. Oh, that's in um, Ramsey or Englewood? It's, it's in East Village, actually. Oh, very cool. So as Brian mentioned, the tower was stabilized in the 90s. This was a pretty huge project. And it re- they reinforced the soil under the foundation and made room for the tower to compress some soil and straighten back to the north. The cost of this project was 30 million euro, and it took... A little bit over a decade. It, the project ran from 1990 to 2001, and unfortunately, the tower was closed during this project, so it wasn't accessible. Which, I mean, for a pretty major tourist attraction that's selling three million tickets a year, being closed for a decade is probably a pretty big deal, and a, probably also a pretty big blow to ticket sales and potential revenue for the tower. Which, I mean, I would assume I can only assume that they use that revenue to repair and maintain and keep the tower standing so you know that that to me says that the project was really really important and a huge factor in keeping the tower standing the stabilization project was led by john berland an emeritus professor and senior research investigator at the department of civil and environmental engineering of imperial college in london he led 13 experts appointed to fix the tower and This is really interesting. So Berlin started his career in 1967 with a thesis called, quote, deformation of soft clay. So he was kind of the perfect man for this job. So how did they stabilize the tower? What did they do? First, they placed counterweights on the north side of the tower's base to slow down the lean from the south. So they basically applied weight on the north side to kind of hold the tower from sinking further to the south. And then they used steel cables Cables comparable to those you'd find on a suspension bridge. And they harnessed the tower to prevent it from collapsing. And then when the time was right, they pulled it back once the soil was prepared. So they they used these cables to basically hold the tower in place. So while they were doing their work so that they didn't accidentally collapse the tower as part of the project. And then once they were ready, once the foundation was was more secure, they used those cables to pull the tower back to as close to vertical as, as they could. They also dug wells under the foundation of the tower, and they removed just over 60 cubic meters of clay. They drained the water from those wells, and they reinforced the foundations with 15-meter concrete pillars. Yes, so this is really cool. Like They're they're using, obviously, very modern techniques to stabilize a building, you know, that's almost a thousand years old, but still keeping the lean to it that it's famous for, although reducing it. Yeah, so they were able to recover 38 centimeters of lean from the project. Although since it's completed, it's started to lean again. And between 2001 and 2013, it had leaned back an additional 2.5 centimeters. But I mean, still not to where it was before. That said, and like we said earlier, they believe that this stabilization project has allowed the tower to be safe for at least another 200 years. So people of Pisa, of course, they want the tower to stay standing and they want it to be stable, but they don't want it to be straight. 
the tower is known to be a leaning tower. It's always leaned. They want it to be a leaning tower. That's part of its charm. So again, they're happy that it's stabilized, but they want it to keep leaning. They don't want it to be straight. And so having the tower lean just slightly, which it, which it currently does, it still does have a lean to it. That's definitely beneficial for the people of Pisa that that they like that. And I don't really blame them. I mean, it would be weird to have the leaning Tower of Pisa not lean anymore. Yeah, then it would just be the Tower of Pisa and it doesn't quite have the draw. No. And also, I got to wonder, let's say they made the foundation completely straight, but remember the tower is built with a curve in it because it was leaning when they constructed it. So the south side is taller than the, than the north side. So if they built it completely straight, then would they not potentially create other issues with it potentially starting to lean to the north side because of the extra weight applied at the top of the tower. Like, I'm wondering if making it too vertical could potentially create other destabilization issues. And maybe I'm overthinking it. I don't have the answer. I just have lots of questions. You know this if you listen to the show. I don't have the answers, but I have so many questions. So, yeah, I'm happy that it's stabilized. I'm happy that it's still leaning. And if I ever make it to Italy, I'm certainly going to go check it out. Yeah, I think it would be super cool to see. Um, Italy is actually one of the few countries I haven't been to in Europe. And um, maybe once we can travel a little bit more freely with the COVID things, I will go take a picture of this. Yeah, a picture of you pushing it back up. Um, it seems like everyone does that one. So I think I'll try to think of a much more interesting picture. Fair enough. You could go from the other way and make it look like you're planking the tower. Could go that way or kicking it over. <laughs> Brian's like, how do I get out of that? I don't want to do that. But I don't want or to tell maybe, that idea is dumb. Or maybe I can bring the inflatable <laughs> dinosaur costume and have my own little Godzilla moment. Do you have an inflatable dinosaur costume? Yes. Why would you ask this question? Well, I don't have one. Does, is that, does everyone have one? Am I missing out? Am I behind? I don't know. You were definitely missing out. In fact, I have a child-sized costume that I had to order one time when the adult <laughs> ones were out of stock. All right, so there you have it, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. What started out as just a bell tower is now known worldwide for its iconic lean. The tower taught us a lot about geotechnical, civil, and structural engineering and has been a tourist attraction to millions of people every year. Even though they straighten the tower, the people of Pisa are happy it still leans. For photos, sources, and an episode summary from this week's episode, head to failureology.ca. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, please rate, review, and subscribe to Failureology so more people can find us. If you want to chat with us, our Twitter handle is at Failureology. You can email us at thefailureologypodcast at gmail.com, or you can connect with us on LinkedIn. You can also check out our Patreon page, which has mini failure episodes. We are continually adding to this, so as time goes on, we will have more and more mini fails. Those come out on opposite Sundays from the episodes. Check out the show notes for links to all of these, and please feel free to reach out. Don't be shy. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks, everyone, for listening. The next episode is our one-year anniversary of the podcast, and we're going to do a year in review and talk about all of the things we've learned over the last year, about podcasting and about engineering and about engineering failures. So please tune into that. It's going to be a fun, special episode that's a little bit different than the norm, but uh, you're going to, you know, you're going to hear lots from us about kind of what we've been up to this last year and and what we've been doing to work on the show. Bye everyone. Talk soon.